Crazy day yesterday. I am going to do this live. We're going to do this recording. No cuts, no edits, no breaks. We're going to do this real and raw. My name is Alicia. I'm a criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor in Atlanta, Georgia. I worked at the exact same office where Young Thug is now being prosecuted. And I've worked with, against, and in close proximity to a lot of these attorneys, a lot of these prosecutors, and a lot of judges who are handling all of the recent high profile cases in Fulton County. So the value add that I bring is that I'm a local attorney who was there very much on the ground for years and years and years. Now, today, let's cover the Young Thug trial where Brian Steele, Young Thug's attorney, was held in contempt yesterday and held in custody for a very brief period. What I want to do now is I want to go over and play that initial clip fully from beginning to end about uh, whether when Brian Steele was having this discussion, this kind of tense discussion with the judge. I want to play that clip and then I want to do a legal analysis of it. So excuse me while I play that, but y'all, this was wild. Um, and I think it's important for us to see that full clip. Here it is. So that we don't, we, nobody can argue that anything was taken out of context and we want to hear everything that Brian Steele said, how he said it, when he said it. So let's get into this clip. Go ahead. Um, the way I understand my constitutional obligations <clears throat> pursuant to the 6th and 14th Amendments of the United States Constitution, the corresponding sections of the Georgia Constitution, I'm required to make a full and complete statement to the court. Um, for the record, and if, if, God forbid, this goes up on appeal for the appellate courts or another tribunal, commission, or administrative body, I was told, based upon information and belief, that when we arrived at 8.30, 9 o'clock today, um, we did not come into your courtroom until almost 11, 11.30. And what I found out just recently, this is not waived, is that um, supposedly in chambers, this honorable court, honorable court reporter at times, mm. honorable court at times, district attorney or district attorneys from the DA's office, as well as investigators, sheriff deputies, Mr. Copeland and his counsel uh, met together. None of the defense team, to my knowledge, was aware that this was going on. It was told, based upon information belief, that Mr. I said I was going to play the full clip without interrupting. I lied. So sorry. I want to already. I'm sorry. I have so much to say already. So what happened was court started late and court oftentimes starts late. In Fulton County. When Fulton County says nine o'clock, baby, they mean 1030. You still need to get there at nine just in case the judge does surprise you and wants to pop up on time that day. But Fulton County consistently starts court late. So what happened is court started late and the defense attorneys, nobody knew what was going on. The prosecutor, at least one of the prosecutors was not in the courtroom, but the defense attorneys didn't know why. For all intents and purposes, this was another regular late court start day, only to find out later that the reason court started late was because there was this conversation what appears to have been this private meeting, private conversation happening between the judge and the witness and the prosecutors and maybe defense counsel, one of the attorneys for uh, witness Kenneth Copeland, but not the other defense attorney. So that is what Brian uh, Steele is talking about here. That it was told to the, the district attorneys that Mr. Copeland intended to plead the Fifth Amendment. Then I was told, based upon information and belief, that Adrian Love the lawyer for Mr. Copeland and this court um, were together and Ms. Love made representations that John Melnick supposedly spoke with some attorneys for the accused and wrote an email to Ms. Love, to Adrian Love, um, stating that Mr. Melnick does not represent the witness and that Mr. Melnick wrote an email saying F you and then somehow that email was CC'd to me, that never Mr. Started. Mr. Steele, can I interrupt you for just a second? I'm kind of disturbed because that's ex parte. This All that was an ex parte conversation. Pause right here. So the judge immediately, so Brian Steele, and unless I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, go back and listen to it. Brian Steele did not call, call the conversation ex parte. The judge seems to come out and say, this was an ex parte conversation. So we're not labeling it as ex parte. The judge himself has said this was an ex parte conversation though. So a conversation that happened, without the other uh, attorneys present. That's gonna be important. How did you find out about any of that? Well, I'm gonna disturb too. And the reason well, is- I, I'm asking you a question. I, and I'm how did you find out about it? I'm gonna ask you the question. Okay. 
scuttle if you look at s again so we see here brian Steele talking about this private conversation that happened which which i want everybody to understand this is extremely important that is a huge issue this allegation that there was a private conversation with the uh, defense witness with the witness rather uh from the prosecution side a hostile witness but a, a witness called by the prosecution that and we don't know the contents of that conversation and that conversation or even the meeting wasn't made available the defense attorneys were not informed of that meeting that is a huge 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 itch issue and instead of addressing that issue you hear the judge say well how did you find that out he doesn't talk about the conversation or whether the conversation was supposed to have happened or not he says how did you find that out? Flipping it on the defense attorney instead of addressing what I think is the real issue here, which is that private conversation. C-U-D-D-E-R versus state, which is 298 Georgia, 438, it's division two, 782 Southeast 2D, 638, 2016. Our highest court says when a court meets, because Mr. Copeland comes in, meets with the court, the court supposedly made statements, which I assume is somehow what accurate based upon what you just said we're entitled mr williams and every other person wrongly charged here is entitled under the georgia constitution to be present that's well, a critical I've, stage it's just like when you meet with me and you and mr adams meet with me and others have met with me it's it's those were ex parte for, for a lot of different other reasons but i will i will certainly note that for purposes of record well i'm going forward what I was told was that Mr. Copeland said, and you haven't answered my question yet. I'm not. How did you? That question. You're not. No, I will not answer that. Question. Why will you not answer that question? Because I want to make sure that what I say is accurate, and I'm not trying no, to. No, 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 no. I'm asking you, how did you get this information? I'm not telling the court. What I'm saying is based on information. Okay. Please. Well, listen. If you don't tell me how you got this information, then you and I are going to have some problems. We can have. His, I have problems right now. Okay. Like I, I know. I, look, I don't. I don't want to know about your problems. Okay. At this point in time, all I'm asking you at this point in time is, how did you come upon this information? you look. If the case gets reviewed, the record's going to be available for for for, for our appellate court. And for whatever reason, but it's disturbing that how so somehow you have surreptitiously gotten information in regards to the court's private ex parte conversation with a party. What's disturbing is that this conversation happened. What's disturb disturbing is the conversation happened and the defense counsels were not made aware. You hear Brian Steele talking there about the Constitution. You have a right to confront witnesses. You have the right to cross-examine witnesses. If there's a conversation that's happening, and unfortunately, you can't give anybody the benefit of the doubt. We don't know what happened in that conversation. Maybe they only talked about the Fifth Amendment, maybe. But if they talked about something else, if they talked about something more, even if they only talked about the Fifth Amendment, arguably... The defense counsels have a right to cross-examine Kenneth Copeland about these conversations. And the fact that this wasn't made available, that is not, that's not just a, a, a small faux pas. That is a violation. What the defense attorney is arguing here is that is a violation of his client's constitutional rights. That is a huge, huge issue. And it just looks really bad here because the judge keeps hammering the defense attorney about how did the defense attorney find out about it instead of addressing the main issue here, yeah. which is, why did this conversation happen? I mean, a, party, I would like, yes. a witness who was sworn in Friday, the court's telling, this is what I was told. If this is not true, not true. This court Mr. handed Steele, Mr. Me, Copeland tell me how, tell me how you got, Tell me how you got the information. Let me, let, listen, tell, you want you, to do tell me how you got the information, then we can I'm, go ahead and go forward. I'm not going to say that. What I'm going well, to say is this. I was told, and I hope this concerns the court. It, it concerns told. me that you have proprietary information Why is it or proprietary? information that 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 you should not be having that was ex parte. Why? With a party. Why? State of Georgia. How about the witness? How about Mr. Copeland, who supposedly announced he's not testifying and he'll sit for two years and then supposedly no, the that's, dishonorable court. Okay. Th or excuse me, let me rephrase that. This court supposedly said, exactly. that's that told you. He said this honorable court, excuse me, this court. Woo! He's basically saying, no, this court is not honorable, but it is a court. So I'll go ahead and give you that. Until the end of this trial, Ms. Hilton supposedly said actually all of the defendants and then all 26 people are disposed of. If that's true, what this is, is coercion. We have to talk about that. So what happened here? What you, this It's really important to understand what, what Brian Steele just said there. So he said, listen, there's a conversation that's happening in chambers or wherever it happened, a private conversation that's happening where Kenneth Copeland, the witness who pled the fifth, is 
saying he's going to plead the fifth. He's letting everybody know he doesn't want to testify. What the judge is saying is, okay, well, uh, you don't have to, if you don't testify, I'm going to put you in custody for, and I can hold you in custody until the end of this trial. And what the prosecutor then says in response is actually no judge. You don't have to only limit it until the end of this trial. You can hold that individual until the end of all the trials. So until the, uh, all of the criminal defendants in this Rico trial uh, have been uh, disposed of until their cases are closed, which God knows how long, we don't know how long it's going to be. That could be forever. This trial is already the longest trial in Georgia history. It's taking forever. And so to say that someone can be in custody until God knows when, until question mark, until infinity and beyond, that's a problem. And that's exactly what uh, the the prosecutor said. And so the defense attorney is going to say here, well, that's coercion. You're basically saying testify or you can count your days in, in jail until you can't count the days any longer. And witness intimidation ex parte communications that we have a constitutional right to be present for. So I understand that you're upset towards me, but Mr. I don't know what I did. Mr. Steele, I still want to know, how do. did you come upon this information? Who told you? What I want to know is why wasn't I there? Why, Sir, I'm going to hold you in contempt if you don't tell me who this, I'm not, I tell, me, tell me who this information don't was coming from. I want to be held in contempt. Well, I'm then, not answering that question. That's attorney-client privilege information. I am not uh, attorney-client privilege. Unless you were in my chambers, that's I'm the only way you can figure out. That's not true. So that's not true. So it's attorney-client privilege information. So we don't know how Brian Steele got this information. And essentially, if he's saying that's attorney-client privilege, who knows? Maybe somebody told his client, his client told him, that's attorney-client privilege information. You can't reveal this information that you received from your client um, through the course of your privileged and private communications, confidential communications. You don't. The argument here is that you don't have to tell the judge that information because you do have a professional responsibility Beyond professional responsibility, you have a responsibility to your client to not give this information that could harm your client in the future or betray your client. That's just not something that you can participate in. And this is the this is the issue with this whole hearing. This is one of the one of the many issues of this whole hearing. Uh, I am. I tell you, you what. I'm going to give you five minutes. If you don't tell me, you don't who have you, to. I'm if gonna, you don't tell me who it is, I'm going to put you. In, I'm, 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 I'm going to put you in contempt I because. Understand. That is not attorney client privilege, <laughs> attorney work product privilege. I am not. How did you, you how did you get that information I supposedly from that. my chambers? Did somebody tell you? I'm not. You should have told me. Well, you got five minutes. Well, you know, I don't need it. I want to continue. Five, you got five minutes? This is what I was told. Mr. Copley says Mr. Copley made says, statements you. that he admitted to killing Donovan Thomas. That I is was, don't take my notes. No, huge. No, no, no. That is huge. That is huge. First of all, Brian Steele alleges that Kenneth Copeland made statements that he alleges to killing, that he says he killed Donovan Thomas. That's ginormous because it could exonerate, um, you know, these RICO defendants if they've been charged with killing Donovan Thomas. There are so many murder allegations. This, this indictment is really complicated. People don't even know what this trial is about. Understand me? People don't even remember what this trial is about. So this has gone way off the rails for the prosecution because when you have people talking more about the judge, when you have them talking about shady things happening in court and talking less about the defendants in the case and what they have been accused of and what they've allegedly done, that is a problem for the prosecution. And it begins to look like Young Thug and the other defendants might be found not guilty simply because there's so much, so much, I don't even raw, raw stuff happening in this trial that gets away from the main crux of the issue, which is, did these individuals commit these crimes or not? And I got to tell you, even though the jury is not present during these conversations. So right now, during this conversation that uh, Brian Steele is having with the judge, the jury is not present during that conversation. But still, I mean, even if you're watching the trial when the jury is present, there's all sorts of just stuff happening. Things are going off the rails. The witnesses look crazy. They don't want to communicate. They look they look like they're kind of making fools out of the prosecution. It's just not going well. And when you co compare that with the fact that the trial is already longest, the longest one in Georgia history has been going on so long, dragging on, the jurors probably don't even know why they were initially there. And that, again, does not fare well for the prosecution. So that's the first clip that I wanted to play for you guys. And what happened after that is uh, Brian Steele didn't give up the information. He stood 10 toes down. He stood on business and the judge took him into custody. Now he took him into custody briefly because again, this is such a huge problem. They're in the middle of a RICO trial, a huge trial, a really complex and complicated trial. So taking the attorney away 
in the middle of the trial, how does that work? You have the right to counsel. You have, especially if you can pay for an attorney, you have the right to, for your attorney that you paid for to be present in your trial. A lot of people have been saying, oh, he has another attorney, which he does. He has Keith Adams. doesn't matter. He has the right to Brian Steele as well, his attorney that he paid for and who I believe might be the lead attorney. I don't know. Um, they have not I don't think they revealed which one of the attorneys is lead and which one isn't. But regardless of that fact, he has the right to the attorney that he paid for to be there. So it doesn't matter. You guys are like, oh, he has another attorney. Doesn't matter. He paid for Brian Steele. Brian Steele should be there. And the client said that he does not want to go forward in the trial without Brian Steele being present. So what you saw then was the judge kind of backtracking and saying, okay, well, I'm not going to put you in custody right now, which duh, how are you going to put a defendant, uh, an attorney in custody during the trial? He said he's going to put him in custody at 5 p.m. and that he's going to stay there. Then after that, you saw the judge change his mind yet again. But before we get to that, let me play another clip of the defense attorney for Brian Steele. So Brian Steele, the attorney had to get an attorney. He had to get attorneys to represent him. And I want to go through the arguments that those attorneys were making on Brian Steele's behalf, because it goes deeper into whether the judge has the right to hold Brian Steele in contempt for making what I believe, in my opinion, is a valid motion. And it gets a little bit deeper into the case law and the um, some of the rules that were violated that the, uh, that the defense attorneys alleged that, that were violated. So I think that would be really interesting for us to watch and analyze as well. So let me pull that up in just. So let's get into this next clip. For those of you who have been following along diligently, you will rec recognize this person as Ashley Merchant. Now, Ashley Merchant is the defense attorney who cracked open, who brought that motion for Fonnie Willis to be disqualified. That case is still being litigated. It's on appeal right now. So this is that same attorney. She is the president of the Georgia Association for Criminal Defense Lawyers. And now she has entered an appearance representing Brian Steele on this contempt. Let me also, well, I'm going to wait to say the sentence later, but you know, a little teaser. If you've already been following along, you know that Brian Steele has been sentenced to no more than 20 days in custody. He can serve that time on the weekends. The judge has not pronounced it yet in this clip. He's going to wait and do that towards the end. But I want to get into this, this argument presented by Ashley Merchant and another attorney, uh, her co-counsel as well. Microphone, it'll, it'll pick up, madam. Thank you so much. It'll turn green. Yeah, it'll turn green. Yes, ma'am. Is it on now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, judge, just for the record, is so is the criminal contempt, is it criminal contempt that you held him in? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you said you had a hearing earlier today. I No, and with criminal contempt, I told him what the contempt was, and that was he refused to tell, you know, order of the court, if counsel, as you know, if the court orders you to do something and you don't, that's criminal contempt. So she's asking this because there are different forms of contempt. There's criminal contempt and there's civil contempt. And as we go along here, we will see that there is confusion on the part of one party uh, present um, who seems not to understand the difference between civil and criminal contempt. And we will see that as, as the case progresses. Contempt. So I've asked him several times, please just tell me who it is that told you that I didn't ask or inquire about anything that was said. I just want to know who it was. Okay. Because he's got too much detail of this particular alleged conversation for, for the court to be concerned about it. So, And Judge, since it is a criminal contempt, he is entitled to due process. He's entitled to a hearing, entitled to an actual show cause, entitled to the mm. allegations actually written, entitled to a witness list. We're entitled to present our own witness list. And well, no, notice of that contempt, cr criminal contempt is different. It is on the spot. So he's gotten the due process he's going to get. That's on the spot. I told him, plus he's had all day to tell me who it is that is it. So a little different, Ms. Merchant, I'm going to disagree with you, but well, and okay. Judge, just, just for the record, it's, um, that's direct. So what you're holding him in is in direct criminal contempt. Okay. So let's talk about what just happened. So what the attorney is saying is that because the defense attorney, Brian Steele was held in criminal contempt, he has certain due process rights. He's got rights just like anybody else who's been accused of a crime. He's got a right to a hearing. He's had, he has a right to uh, present witnesses. He has a right to interview witnesses. He has a right to cross-examine witnesses, which the judge in this case would be a witness because he held him in contempt, but also because this judge is one of the parties to this ex parte communication that's been alleged, right? It's got the judge 
would have had to have been there. It can't be an ex parte communication if the judge was not present, right? So Brian Steele has all these rights that are being violated, all these rights that are associated that uh, with being held in contempt prior to the judge being able to sentence him to whatever the judge is going to pronounce the sentence to be. And that didn't happen here. There was no hearing today. Um, and that's what the defense attorney is arguing here. And she's going to break that down even further. Yes. Um, the issue with the direct criminal contempt is whether or not to actually hold a hearing now, whether or not it needs to be held immediately. And the problem is, if you hold him in direct criminal contempt, as you're saying that you did, you are a witness to that proceeding. And so it has to be referred to another judge doesn't require a recusal, you actually have to sui sponte, send it to another judge because you are a witness to the proceeding. Show me the case law that says that, Ms. Yes, Merchant. it is I, Henry McClarty. It's 152 Georgia App 399. And it says um, that that is one of the cases. Also, two other cases, Henry Adams, 215 Georgia App 372. Well, one second. Give me the name of the first case again. So now the attorney is citing case law for the judge to look up. And she's basically saying that because the judge is a witness to this proceeding, so because he was there, he not only issued the contempt, he's also part of that ex parte communication, as I was just saying, then the judge actually has to send this case off to another judge to determine or to, to, to decide these issues. He can't be the witness, the, the executioner, and the jury, you know, that's not how that works. The judge actually needs to sui sponte. That means on his own without anyone else forcing him to do so. He needs to, on his own, send that case out to another judge to look at. And I, it doesn't require recusal. The defense attorney is saying it doesn't require you to take yourself off of the case completely off of the entire criminal trial, but you do need to send this issue, this, this question of contempt over to another judge to look at uh, before you just issue the contempt. And now she's talking about case law. Um, let's go ahead and pull up those cases and see what those cases say. She's saying that they uh, stand for the contention that the judge actually needs to refer this case out to somebody else. So let's go ahead and look at those cases. One judge. Yeah, I would. Thank you. 215. 215. Georgia app. Georgia app. 372. Okay. Also 215. Georgia app. 349. Okay. That's Adams and Hasty. All right. Let me take a look at that. Okay, so she just gave the court two cases to look at. Um, and he's going to look at those and read them and see if they apply. 215 Georgia App 372. You have anything a little bit a little more current than 1994? Um, Hasty is 94. Unfortunately, contempt is, of attorneys is not a common proceeding. So That's most so of the cases are a little bit older. So let's pull up Enray Adams. I have it here. I'm looking at it on the side. Um, but I do have other cases. And, and Judge, I'm not the only one here. Um, there's quite a few other lawyers that want to be present in the court. Um, there's about 20, 25. The challenge is I have space, space allocations, as I told you. So you can, uh, like I said, since you are representing him, that's fine. You, uh, he, he told us, Mr. Steele told us that. Anybody else, because I have security concerns as well, and we have to vet people to come in, then they can go to 8-H, and they can certainly watch the proceedings from there. Okay. And judge, for security purposes, they're all attorneys. Um, they're all members of the bar. I can give still you all their names. You still would have to be searched. You still would have to be subject to the court's protocols. And also, um, there's room in the jury box, and then there's room in the courtroom. So we would ask that they be allowed I to. I don't it. want them in my jury box, okay? Okay, so let's look. I've had an opportunity to find the case. Let me pull that up real quick, see if I can share my screen on this other video. Um, let me see. Let me see. All right, I might have to stop the sharing that one. Let me present this. So this is Enray Adams. And a lot of times I just pull stuff up on free websites that you guys can look at and use too. But here we go. Essentially, the attorney in this case was held in contempt. And if you scroll down, the case says, an attorney may not be held in contempt of court merely for presenting in good faith a motion which he has a right to make, nor may an attorney be held in contempt merely because having filed such motion, motion he fails to prevail on it. So in this case, one of the arguments is that Brian Steele had the ability. This was a good faith motion. He made a motion um, talking about 
this ex parte communication, a motion for a mistrial. I don't know if he said mistrial or not, but he made this motion, which should really should be a motion for a mistrial because there was this communication between the judge and other individuals, which he became aware of. And for the court to then put him in contempt based on that good faith motion, right? Uh, one of the arguments is that the court is not allowed to do that. Now, of course, the court is saying, well, they're not holding it con him in contempt because he made the motion, but because he refused to reveal how he found out um, the information. But if we read the case a little bit here, we, here we get into some of the due process issues that the attorney was talking about. So the case says the trial court made the summary contempt finding without providing Adams with notice of such intent at the time the court scheduled the hearing thereon and without providing him with an opportunity to be heard or be represented by counsel before summarily finding Adams in criminal summary contempt of court. You guys, you have to think about it. Anytime that you have this criminal, anytime you have criminal um, sentences or criminal possibilities, right, where you're going to be going to jail, you're, you, you should be thinking alarm bells should be going off in your head. And you should be thinking that you have some sort of right to due process, right? This matters in a contempt hearing, any hearing of that nature. So for a judge to kind of just say that you're going to be doing these this time in custody, as he will eventually say, without the attorney having a hearing, having uh, the ability to present witnesses, having the ability to be represented by counsel, you should be thinking that's going to be a due process violation. And that's what this case essentially uh, stands for, among other things. So let's switch back now to the hearing and see what Ashley Merchant, the defense attorney, has to say for her client, who is also a defense attorney, Brian Steele. Yeesh, this case is getting messy. May um, one additional attorney come in, then Alex Suser. And we're here on behalf of Gactel for our strike force. He is the chair of the strike force. I'm the president of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and also a member of the strike force. So can he come in as another attorney co-counsel? Yeah, I certainly may. Sure. Great. Alex Suser. Alex Susor. Thank you, Judge. Henry Adams, uh, I, I, it, 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 it has two issues. One is the motion for disqualification. Okay. And that's, um, and I think the judge, the judge went ahead and did some other things that caused that, caused there to be that issue presented. So, I don't think Adam, I'm gonna take a look at the other case. Um, that was in the abs. That was 215 Georgia 372. I'm gonna yes. look at the other case just a second. And there's several others when you're ready. So basically the judge is trying to distinguish the cases. The judge is saying that the the first case that the attorney gave to him in Ray Adams, that's located at in Ray hasty 215 Georgia app 349. She's saying that the judge is saying that that case doesn't apply here because the judge, the judge in that case did some other things. He didn't really clarify why exactly he thinks that case is distinguishable than from the present case. Um, but I'm looking at the case right now and it does say that there should have been in that case, a separate hearing. So it says, um, on appeal, Hasty argues, let me just pull it up for you guys so we can all read it together. Um, it says right here on appeal, Hasty, the defendant in that case argues that the trial court erred in finding him in contempt and in failing to allow a separate hearing. Additionally, Hasty contends that the evidence was insufficient to support a criminal a finding of criminal contempt. So, you know, what the argument again here is that there are these due process rights that need to happen. And that didn't happen here. There was no separate hearing. I mean, we're having a discussion now about whether he deserves a separate hearing, but there was no separate hearing that was had in this case. So this is another one of those cases. And the defense attorney you heard saying before um, the judge went to review the case or when, when he looked away to review the cases, you heard her saying that she has many other cases. You will also note that these cases are pretty old. Um, if you look at this case, it looks like it's from 1994. And as the defense attorney was saying, that's because you just don't see contempt often. This is not often litigated, especially not to the point where it gets up to the higher courts, so the appellate courts. And as a result, there are not really that many recent cases on this matter. All right, so let's hop back over to Ashley Merchant. 
and get back into the hearing. Yes, it may be one I have too. All right, so Mike's turned off because the deputy looks like it's talking to the judge. I'm going to skip ahead here, see if we can get to the attorney's arguments. But yeah, so the judge is trying to review these cases and see if they do apply and see what he needs to do next because. It obviously it appears the case is kind of giving rise to a level of assistant warrant summary contempt by the court. That's the that's the difference with Hasty um, than in this particular case. So, so basically, you said those two cases are distinguishable. I distinguish your two cases that you've given me thus far. Distinguishable means those two cases don't apply to the current situation because the current situation is different. And so the judge is saying that those cases that talk about um, the right to a hearing, the due process, all that good stuff, he's saying that those cases don't apply to this particular case. So he actually doesn't have to do or doesn't need to do what the defense attorney is saying that he needs to do. So those, were only, those were only the initial two. I had a couple others okay, go ahead. as well. Yes. So um, Ramirez versus <laughs> State, it's 279, Georgia 13. 2005. So now the defense attorney is saying, well, actually, I have multiple. So if those two don't apply, we'll go ahead and, and look at these other um, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 50, 11 cases and see if those apply as well. Take a, take a gander. Um, it also. You said 279 Georgia what? I'm sorry. Georgia 13. Georgia 13. Mm -hmm. It's a 2005 case. Right. And it defines direct um, contempt and explains that it must actually interfere with the proceedings right. to be direct. There's also a couple other cases on that. See, but you're all covering under, um, let me see. I'm sorry, Judge. Hold on, <coughs> just a second. So what she said there was that there needs to be some sort of interference with the proceedings um, for the contempt. And there, we haven't seen that here. As a matter of fact, the proceedings pretty much the trial kept going, um, even after this and the next day today. So uh, on Tuesday, so this happened on Monday and Tuesday, the trial continued, the trial continued, I think after this, I mean, the, I, I would, I would argue that there's no real interference in the proceedings. Sure. The proceedings, uh, stopped for a moment only because the judge didn't properly follow the protocol, but that's not interference on behalf of the attorneys. <laughs> if the judge didn't do something he was supposed to do, I mean, that's not their fault that they have to then stop and explain. Actually, judge, this is how this proceeding is supposed to go. All right, skip ahead. The contempt is directed. The trial court has the power after comforting the contempt door to opportunity to speak in his own behalf. 
announce punishment summarily without further notice or hearing. I already did that, Mr. Steele. He's so what the judge is saying is that when you, with this form of contempt, all he has to do is allow the attorney to speak out on their own behalf, defend themselves, which he, the judge is saying he allowed the defense attorney to do, and then the judge can go ahead and dole out punishment. So the judge is saying that he was proper in this case. He already told me, I already gave him the opportunity to do that. So um, we had that conversation this morning already. So, um, and judge, it's so there's a couple different issues. First, the question is whether or not you need to have that hearing now. I know you're saying that you had the hearing earlier, but but regardless, he was entitled to have an attorney at that point and he didn't have one. So the question is initially whether or not you even need to hear this now. And some of the cases I've cited, along with some others, say that a summary proceeding is not necessary in a case like this. And the best evidence of that is the trial has continued. Right. It has not stopped this trial. Yeah. So for you to hold a summary hearing of direct contempt, the court has to be able to state how this interferes with your ability to administer justice in this case. Oh, and um, I can tell you because it is a it is a violation of the, the sacrosanct nature of the court's ability to hold ex parte conversations without those being broadcast to other people. And as to how as to as to how that information was disclosed, that's a pro that's a real problem. That's why it's of such, you know, such an issue for the court at this point in time. Judge, in the, you know, Mr. Steele has a right to make a motion like this. If he, there were he experts, does, he does, he does, he does. I'm, but, not, I'm not, I'm not saying anything, but you know, he, 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 um, but he's kind of put himself in the, in the particular position he's in. No, Judge, I don't agree. I, well, I, I believe I'm gonna, that I'm going to disagree with you. Okay. I believe that the court has put him in that position. No, he exactly. What I was saying earlier. Held in the law states, McClarity, which I. That's the problem. It's like I, <laughs> the court is has. Oh, how do I say this? In my opinion, it appears the court has been kind of putting everything back on the defense attorney. Oh, well, how did you find out about this private conversation? You're in trouble because you didn't tell me. Oh, well, uh, it's interfering with my ability to administer justice because you won't tell me about how you found out, found out about this private conversation when I think the issue should be why did this private conversation happen? What was said during this private conversation? And mind you, apparently there was a court reporter either present the whole time or in and out. I don't know, but... Presumably, there's some sort of court reporter present during that hearing, and that person transcribed it, but the judge, I think, has said that, okay, well, the appellate court will hear that. Y'all not going to see this transcript. And again, it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, it seems like it would make sense to hand over the transcript and see what was said in the, in the conversation. And it's true that direct summary contempt, which arises in the presence of the court, intends to scandalize it and or hinder or obstruct the orderly, pres orderly process of the administration of justice, the preservation of order and decorum in the court is exempt from due process requirements of notice and hearing. That's even moody. It goes back to 1974. Go back. Requirements of this. The preservation of order and decorum in the court is exempt from due process. The court intends to scandalize it and or hinder or obstruct the orderly, pres orderly process of the administration of justice. The preservation of order and decorum in the court is exempt from due process requirements of notice and hearing. That's even moody. It goes back to 19. So the court is saying that the that contempt, the contempt, contempt here is um, not subject to due process requirements. You don't get a, you don't get notice. You don't get a hearing. You don't get nothing. You get held in contempt and you get taken back into custody. Seventy four. So nineteen seventy four. I, I believe that Mr. Steele's he can file whatever motions, but his particular actions in this case, I just want to know who told him this. That's all. I'm not asking him to to, to release or or otherwise tell tell any conversations but i just want him to tell me that and judge so that's what you want but that does not conflate to a contempt your desire for him to answer your question does not mean that you have the power to hold him in so contempt. you can come into court miss merton and not answer a question of the court and not be found held in contempt if it's a question that the court is not permitted to ask yes okay well this and this is a question the court's permitted to ask. And it's our position. If we had a hearing, we could explain to the court why he is not required. First of all, the court accused him of eavesdropping. That is a crime. He has a Fifth Amendment privilege against answering those questions. Rule 1.6 mm -hmm. protects all confidential information that is gained not from your client, but in representation, re representation of your client. He has the ability to protect that information. But we don't even need to get there because... He can't be held in contempt and you can't threaten him with contempt for presenting a motion in good faith.
He presented a motion in good faith that he believed there were ex parte communications. You are a witness to that because it's my understanding that you were part of those ex parte communications. They okay, let's talk about that. Now. I was taking my notes. So a couple really important things there. So I don't know where the eavesdropping conversation came in because Brian Steele said that and now Ashley Merchant is saying that, that at some point Brian Steele was accused by somebody of eavesdropping. I don't know if the judge said that. I don't know who said that. Uh, maybe I didn't hear that portion. But eavesdropping is absolutely a crime. It's a Title 16 crime, which means it's a crime under Title 16 of Georgia law, uh, which has a whole bunch of different laws. One of those is a uh, prohibition against eavesdropping. And so that is a crime because it's a crime. Brian Steele then definitely doesn't have to answer that question if he was eavesdropping, which I don't think he was, but he has a right against self-incrimination. So he doesn't have to answer that question. Number two, rule 1.6 says that you don't have to reveal this information, this confidential information, whatever you want to call it, that you obtained in representing your client, not directly from your client, but in representing your client or to further represent your client, whatever. And so this information obviously was uh, for the purpose of representing his client and uh, doing zealous advocacy. So, you know, either one of those things would represent a reason why he wouldn't have to answer that question. So what the argument here is, is that sure, typically when a, when the court asks you a question, then you answer that question. But when the court asks a question that you, it is not permitted to ask, then you do not have to, you have rights. Uh, you have the ability, you have recourse in order to not answer those questions and part of not, not be held it's by nature. Okay, well. You have to be involved. Therefore you have to be a witness. So you are a witness. You you got the information allegedly from uh, from an improper methodology. I'm not saying that he eavesdropped. Okay, I'm just I said that one of the things is one of the things is he. It's either one of two ways. He either eavesdropped, which I don't believe he did. At all. But I do believe that somebody did tell him what was the sum and substance of of the or the course conversations and that would not be permissible judge let's just back up for a second he makes a motion because he has reason to believe that there were ex parte communications made the court has a duty if there are ex parte communications made to alert counsel he shouldn't have had to learn it from wherever he learned i it. think that That's he caused problem. that particular circumstance How? i think that he had a conversation with somebody How? come on so basically, Ashley Merchant is going back to that argument that, again, which is, I think, the main issue here is, why did Brian Steele have to learn this com this information from somebody else? Why didn't the court say anything? And the court is saying, well, Brian Steele put himself in that situation. Come on. I don't... And he, and he got some information that he shouldn't have had to begin with. So, Ms. Merchant, I'm of the opinion, I'm going to stand on my ruling at this point in time. I'm going to hold him in contempt. So, at this point in time, is there anything else you want to tell me? Yes, Judge. There's quite a few other things. Um, so first of all, we would ask for you to be recused from this case because you are a witness necessarily. It cannot be an ex parte proceeding without you being a witness to this. So you are a witness to this proceeding. Therefore, yes, to the contempt, to the contempt. You are a witness to the contempt. So you have now, and if it's criminal, which is what you're saying it is, Mr. Steele is entitled to all the same due process rights. So basically the attorney is saying that you, we are asking that you take yourself off of this case. I believe she's limiting it to just the contempt, not the entire criminal trial, but just the contempt. Please take yourself off this case because you're a witness. Yeah. Held him in contempt. Not only that, but you're a party to the ex parte conversation, as I said earlier. So please take yourself off this case. Mr. Williams and every other defendant in this courtroom is entitled to. He's entitled to those. One of those is to have a fair and neutral judge decide his case. One of those is to have a judge who is not also a witness in the proceeding deciding whether or not he's in contempt. This needs to be heard by a different judge. Mm -hmm. And he does, he has the right to subpoena witnesses. He has the right to an attorney. He has the right to due process, notice, a show cause hearing, notice of the alleged violation, whatever rule it is that you're, that the court believes, and a hearing where Don't he can call you as a witness. Else. You can testify. You are necessarily a witness. You really have to testify. You can't. It, it, for it to be ex parte, you have to be a witness. It can't be both ways. Not the silence. I'll let an appellate court decide that. Well. So, anything else? I have to talk about this. I have to talk about this because this could make me scream. 
So what's so frustrating is you don't have that many avenues for recourse if you feel like the judge is doing something wrong or if you feel like the prosecution is doing something wrong. During the trial, you really don't have any recourse because all the, all the judge is going to say is, well, I guess the appellate court will decide it. Guess I'll let the appellate court decide it whenever God knows whenever that's going to happen, whenever this case concludes and, and the case is up on appeal or whenever this 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 goes before an appellate court. If the one of the questions is if the attorneys even have the ability or the right to appeal this ruling. And so he's basically saying, well, let some other court decide it. And we don't know when that's going to be. Do you understand how frustrating that is? Because you have to ask the current judge that you before that you are before who mind you, you think is doing something wrong. Who, th who you think is doing something illegal and uh, improper. You have to ask him to do the right thing and, and take himself off the case or reverse one of his decisions. And if he says, no, you really don't have any recourse until way later down the road, all this time, your client is then having his rights being violated or you're in custody. You got to do all that. You have to already serve your time and then find out on the back end what well, actually, that was incorrect. That is really frustrating and something that you deal with on the daily in cases like this. And there's just not a whole lot of oversight. Um, and there should be more oversight, quite frankly. Anything else? No, we'll file a notice of appeal. Um, okay. And we need well, to have the order reduced in writing. As well. I, I'm, I'm going to do that right now. Um, I will say for the record at this point in time that Mr. Steele has, in fact, um, or has filed, mm -hmm. and I will, uh, I will note this as part for the record. In this case, he has filed a motion to set aside the contempt. He's filed a motion for a supersedious bond, and he's filed a notice of appeal, all of which I will I will include for the SNX court's exhibit in order. But I'm reducing my the contempt to 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 writing, um, and I mentioned earlier. He can um, he can purge himself of the contempt just by telling me who it was, and he can do that this evening. He can do it. He can do it right now. He can do it at any point in time. If not, I'll revisit the circumstance on 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 Friday. And Judge, we would ask that you grant the bond um, at this point. Grant him a bond on that issue. So let's talk about why they want the. They obviously want the appeal or the decision to hold him in contempt and hold him in custody, reduced to writing, so that they can reply and tear it apart <laughs> basically um, and rip into all the legal arguments or lack thereof, whatever arguments are made or whichever ones aren't made that need to be made. So that's one of the reasons. Also, it makes it easier uh, on appeal to review that order and say, well, you said this, this, and that, and this is, this is, and that is incorrect. So um, that is one of the reasons that they want to reduce the writing, but also the law oftentimes does require you to reduce your opinions or decisions into writing. And that might be the case in this particular example. And you don't get a supersedious bond on a, on a criminal contempt though. He can, you can grant him a bond. No, you don't get one on that one. The no. civil is the one that you can hold him until he complies uh, with yeah. the order. And I'm sorry. I think in, um, just the case law on that is in hold, Ray hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Again, so this right here is where you see this kind of confusion on the part of one party about the difference between civil and criminal contempt. And that's nothing to scoff at. I mean, if you're, you know, I don't deal with in civil and criminal contempt oftentimes either. But if I'm going to dole out a punishment, if I'm going to dole out a punishment for contempt, you want to have that correct because you don't want to be improperly incarcerating or putting somebody in custody for reasons that are not Right. We talked about this recently with the judge on the driving while license suspended allegation and why he was so diligent in researching and making sure that he had made the right, right, proper and legal decision. So in this case, when you see the uh, attorney saying, well, actually, no, you can grant him a bond and um, you have the ability to grant him a bond. You know, if you don't want to, sure. But you're saying you can't. That's not true. And actually, it's the civil contempt, not the criminal contempt, where you hold him in custody until he does what you're asking him to do. So this isn't even the right form of contempt to be to 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 have this sort of punishment um, and in, in the way in which you're doing it. And so now the judge is saying he's going to look at some things. The superseded bond requirement does not apply in the contempt in the presence of the court during the progress of a proceeding OCGA 5 6 13 Bravo. Hmm. So you don't get a supersedious on that, on this, on a criminal contempt, respectfully. 
So judge, just to clarify. All right. Before we go into that, basically the judge, the attorneys are requesting him a bond. So they're requesting that he be able to pay a bond and get released. And the judge is saying, no, you don't get a bond. Basically saying that he's going to have to serve those the, the time, period. He's not going to get released, not by this judge. He's not going to be able to pay a bond and, and get out. He's going to have to serve the time. He has no other option unless he wants to reveal the name of the source, which we'll see what happens. It's Tuesday. He's supposed to go into custody on Friday, and we will see if that actually happens because you can never predict what's going to happen next in this case. It's your ruling that this is a criminal contempt that Mr. Steele has committed, not a civil indirect contempt. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, the judge, and that's the reason I'm asking is because the N. Ray Hughes case, which is a 2009 Court of Appeals case, 268, Georgia Appeals 66, lays out the distinction, as does the Ramirez case. There's a new, there's a brand, there's a case that, in fact, um, is... I do one better, sir. In fact, there is a recent pronouncement out of our our appellate courts. Which is, I think I'm I'm addressing a slightly different point of it law. Is, hold on. It's a, it's a... All right, let's hear. Give you two cases. Um, one is. Um, It's um, Utenema, it's a U-N-T-E-M-A versus Smith. And that's 371 Georgia Appeals 19. Um, which um, was decided March of, March the 12th of this year. It covers the differences between the types of contempt. And then there's another case that I'd invite your attention to. And that is Henry um cyberston it's s-y-v-e-r-t-s-o-n and that is 368 georgia appeals uh, georgia so now the judge is saying the judge is basically saying well i also did my research and i believe i can do these things under these cases that i'm going to ask you now to look at so basically at this point the judge is going to stand on his ruling he is not going to remove that contempt order it looks like he's gonna stay and and keep it in place so at this point you really it's yeah. gonna be important for you to just just to make a record continue making a record and like you said the appellate court is going to have to decide because this judge it appears is not going to change his mind that was decided july 31st of last year and judge i'd just like to point two things out the statute that you were citing the um about the supersedious, it only says it's not mandatory. You still have discretion to grant grant him a supersedious bond. Um, the other, I'm not going to grant him a supersedious. And so you definitely have the discretion to grant him a supersedious bond. The other issue is if it is a criminal contempt and you are finding him guilty of criminal contempt, then we have to have a sentence imposed. Now, civil is where you get to hold him until he complies. No, criminal just... is where you get to impose a sentence, maximum twenty days and a thousand dollar fine. So if you're going to incarcerate him under a criminal contempt. He's got to be sentenced. Well, his 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 contempt is as long as he um, when he tells me what what the basis. So basically, she's saying that that you've got these two things mixed up. You are trying to hold him under a criminal contempt where he needs to have these due process rights. He needs to be sentenced. If you want to do him in, under the civil contempt, if you want to hold him in custody under the civil contempt, then sure, that's where you get to hold him in custody until he does what you're you're saying that he you need him to do. But it, it, you keep saying criminal contempt, but you keep saying that you want to have a, a civil contempt remedy. These things don't make sense. And you're also saying that you can't issue him a bond. And that's not what it says. Um, the statute that he's talking about and this is what the defense attorney is saying the statute you're saying you're talking about says that it's not mandatory that doesn't mean that you can't do it um it says it's not mandatory but that doesn't mean that that's not the same as saying you don't have the ability to grant a bond if you don't want to so again she's saying here basically in the kindest way possible that you got these things confused get it together <laughs> respectfully of the conversation was, Ooh, i didn't ask what but he tells me that then i can certainly um he purges himself of the contempt then that's so civil, Judge. That's civil contempt. That's judge. civil. And that's the, I, I, respectfully, I would point you to In Ray Hughes, which stands for the same point of law. Civil contempt impose punishment as a means of coercing future compliance yes. with a prior order of the court. 
Here, the prior order of the court presumably is that you have directed Mr. Steele to answer the question, to dispose the information as to who is his source for knowledge of this ex parte meeting that occurred earlier today. Criminal contempt imposes unconditional punishment to punish the act which has occurred in the past and cannot be purged. It is not capable of being purged, in which case what Ms. Merchant said applies, which is that there is a 20-day maximum sentence and a $1,000 fine. It is, for all intents and purposes, a misdemeanor offense judge, which is why the enhanced due process protections apply to that. Now, Mr. Steele has indicated to us he does not believe that he can answer the question without violating his duty of loyalty and duty of confidentiality to his client. So he is being placed in a position where he's either going to jail or he's going to commit an offense that will put his license to practice law at risk. Period. So essentially, Brian Steele is saying, and I want to go back and summarize that. So there are two types of contempt, civil contempt and criminal contempt. Criminal contempt cannot be purged by going back and revealing the name of the witness. That's civil contempt. So you can't, criminal contempt is for a crime that already occurred and you're now being punished for it. Civil contempt is the coercion that you're not doing something I want you to do. I'm going to hold you in contempt. And that's, but the judge is kind of mixing these two up and saying, well, there's a 20 day max. You're going to purge it. That's not what's going on here. The attorney also made a really excellent salient point saying that, look, in this point, at this point, Brian Steele cannot reveal the source without violating his professional responsibility to his client. That is something that lawyers are bound to. And so if you make me do this, I'm either going to go to jail. I have two options, go to jail or put my license to practice law at risk. I'm not putting my license to practice law at risk. I'm not putting my livelihood at risk just because you are ordering, ordering me to do something that I believe is unlawful. And as a result, I have no other choice except for to go to jail. And the judge is going to say, well, that's Mr. Steele's fault. And that is an untenable position to be in. And Mr. Steele is a zealous advocate for his client. And he is simply trying to protect that duty of loyalty and duty of confidentiality. Because if he answers your question, it is very reasonable to assume and likely that he will be facing a bar complaint that could result in um, a suspension or in, in the loss of his license. And so he's yeah. in, in, a, in a very, very difficult position where if we were able to have a full contested hearing with the benefit of witnesses and an impartial judge where you're a witness and everybody could present their I'm not doing side that. of the story. And I'm not doing that. The reason being is because that, that takes away the whole point of criminal contempt. And that is you do something, the court tells you to do something, order of the court, and you don't follow and you don't follow it. I didn't ask him to do anything. See anything illegal, immoral, unethical. There you go. He's so, asking to tell me. I know I mean, what the which is what, what, the, what the priv I, what the privilege is. The privilege is I, is the conversation. I didn't ask him about that. I there you go. The judge is standing on his ruling. He's saying that he didn't ask the attorney to do anything unlawful. And as a result, the attorney doesn't have the right to not answer or not comply with that order. As a result, contempt. Wanted to ask him about Still, still, still not convinced that's all the way correct. And you're going to see the judge go back in chambers and fix it later. But again, we still see here, I think we have not fully address the issue of the judge kind of conflating these two uh, different types of contempt. I still think that's happening here. Uh, who? The person. And because Mr. that, because, okay, I'm sorry. sorry. Mr. Steele has indicated to us that he does not believe he can answer that question without also violating the privilege. Okay. And judge, that's why we're trying to figure out if it's criminal versus civil. So the issue is you're picking and choosing. You're saying, well, you get the bad side of criminal and no bond, mm -hmm. but I really am actually trying to punish you civilly, which is when you hold oh, someone no, until they no. comply. Okay, let me let, let me think about it just a second, okay? Let me, uh, uh, I'm gonna take five minutes out, I'm gonna think about it. Yeah, because- um, Thank you. So, okay, all right. They're right. All right. So we'll be in recess about five minutes. All right, so let's, I mean, I, he gonna go to recess and realize that they were absolutely 100% correct. I mean, it definitely seemed like he was kind of trying to pick and choose um, which type of contempt he was going to do. And you can't do that. You fig Figure it out. Do the proper guide, <laughs> especially when you're a judge. And 
I mean, it's just a terrible situation to be in. Like losing your bar license. All right, thank you, madam. Or go to jail. So the judge at this point looks like has written an order. Um, here we go. Mike back on. He's going to issue. Sean Brown, is everybody present? Needs to be present? All right. Thank you for your patience, uh, counsels. Um, the court's had an opportunity to reflect. And um, Mr. Steele, if I could ask you to take the podium, please, as well. Now stand next to your attorneys. Okay, Ms. Merchant, um, Mr. Steele, and I apologize. Sue, sir. Mr. Sue, sir. Judge. One more time. Sue, sir. What, spell your last name for us. S-U-S-O-R, Sierra, Uniform Sierra, Oscar. Rebellion. You're a good man. Good man. Okay, all right. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, sir. Okay, Mr. Sue, sir, as well. All right, counsels, I've made a clarification or uh, to the order of contempt. Mr. Steele, I am going to hold you under... Um, still hold you in summary criminal contempt okay. um, pursuant to OCJ 15-1-3 subpart 3 for your failure to comply with my earlier order to today. I'm going to order that you be taken into custody, uh, incarcerated in the Fulton County Jail for more, no more than 20 days for this contempt. Those 20 days consisting of every weekend for the next 10 weekends. Mm. And you'll be reporting to 901 Wright Street, Northwest Atlanta, Georgia, 30318. At 7 p.m. on Fridays, you'll be released on 7 p.m. on Sundays. And it's to commence this Friday, June the 14th at 7 p.m. And not to end until Sunday, August the 18th at 20, uh, 2024, 7 p.m., subject to further order of this court. And that will be entered and e-filed. And you may take whatever steps um, you and your counsel deem uh, appropriate um, after that. Okay? Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'll going to file a notice of appeal, but for whatever reason that doesn't take um, and you don't give a bond, then um, I'd ask that I can uh, be with Mr. Williams and we work on our case all weekend for all those weekends. Otherwise, I can't prepare. I speak with Mr. Williams all the time. That's up to you. And sir, I will start if, if that if that comes to pass. All right. So that's pretty much the end of that. A few things I want to go over. Um, the huge issue here when the defense attorney is going into custody and he's saying he talks with his client all the time, of course he does. They, they're in this really huge RICO trial. And he, at this point, cannot prepare as he would at home because he's in he's in custody. So he needs to at least be able to talk to the client. Client, But even then, there is a ton of discovery in this case, over, over a terabyte of discovery. So is Mr. Steele, is the attorney going to have his laptop? Is he going to have access to internet at all times? Is he going to be able to work on the case in the jail as he would work on it at home? How is he going to be able to work on this case as properly as he needs to work on it? I mean, there, it's going to present a huge issue on that front. Uh, number two, the judge obviously doesn't have control over whether maybe he does, maybe the judge can maybe try to say, well, definitely sell, make sure these two people get together in the same cell. But the jail is probably going to say, well, we don't have the ability or the right, or we don't have the, we can't tell you that we're going to do that, nor do we have to do that if you tell us we have to do that. So if they're going to be cellmates, who even knows, right? Probably not. Uh, but I do, I do think that's probably the best case scenario and is what should happen in a case like this so that they can at least discuss and work on the case if they need to discuss and work on the case. Um, before we wrap up here, two more things. So there was an uh, a order filed, a request for a bond in the criminal contempt filed by someone named Colette Steele. Now, I don't know the really, I don't, some people are saying that that's Brian Steele's wife. I have no idea. I don't know if a sister, wife, you know, a daughter, I have no idea. Um, but someone named Colette Steele did file this motion for a superseded bond for a bond and also filed this motion for an appeal. So I'm going to go ahead and present that on the screen now. We talk, we get into the business today, y'all. This is found on reporter Megan Kunif's website. I also saw it on Twitter, but um, if you don't follow Megan, please go follow Megan. She's giving really great 
uh, explanations and breakdowns of this trial. She is a journalist. So here's the notice of appeal filed by, as you can see down here, Colette Steele. Let me see if I can put it larger, Colette Steele. And then on the page before that, you see um, the motion for a bond, which was denied. You also see here, as Megan has put on her website, um, the order of contempt that was written by Judge Glanville today. So Lots that happened here. Lots that we saw today. I'm going to review my notes just to see if there's anything else I wanted to talk about. Um, nope. I think that covers it. So please, you guys, if you have any other questions, this video is not going to be as polished as the other videos because I don't have time to edit it and make it all nice before I get the information out. Things are happening so quickly. And I do think there's a value in getting the information out as quickly as I can versus making sure it's perfectly polished. So please bear with me. Um, if you stayed until the end, I appreciate you so much. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you the next time something crazy happens in this trial, which will probably be in one to two business days if the trial keeps going as it has.